Okay, welcome back. Everyone settle in. While you're doing that, I just want to say, just listening to the panel about Opportunity Zones, I hope you were as inspired as I was about really what this can do for our state's economy. It, it, it's going to unleash capital, private sector capital, into our disadvantaged communities and our lagging communities in a way that I don't think has ever been seen before, so I really do hope we get it right, and this is just the opening as Dean Bruce was saying, of a long conversation and hopefully a serious um, uh, initiative that is, is going to really transform South Carolina. I really hope a lot of this turns into productive community building investment. That's what we really want to see. So I think it was great to, to hear from the panel and I want to thank again uh, the Federal Reserve of, uh, of Richmond, which is our district, for uh, organizing the panel today. What we're going to do in the second part of our program now is return to the outlook. Um, I'm not just going to talk about trade wars and tariffs. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I want to talk about the outlook overall and reiterate some of the points that Dr. Von Messen was making before, but uh, also clarify some of, of what's going on in the economy and what we see right now and what we see heading into 2019. We know that this is really, uh, the outlook is really looking good. Uh, we believe it is anyways, for the reasons that Joey was talking about already. But at the same time, we know this is a time of considerably uncertainty. And a big source of that uncertainty, Joey mentioned, this has to do with Fed policy, Federal Reserve policy, and interest rates. Uh, and uh, I'll be coming back to that. But also, there's this trade war going on, something that we haven't seen in decades that's causing a lot of anxiety in the business community and really across this country. This is the first time I think we've ever had a trade war fought on Twitter uh, about this, these tweets that our president keeps putting out is putting us in a constant state of disequilibrium, if I can use that economic term, confusing us all as to where we're headed next. Every day it's different. So when I was putting my talk today, I thought I, thought I knew where we were going with trade wars and tariffs, and every day I wake up and it's a new story, it's a new tweet. So uh, we'll be talking about that. But one thing we do know already, we've seen in South Carolina in the last year, Joey was talking about this, our exports were down. And for a state that has long been driven by trade, since our very beginning as a state, you know, we've been a trade-oriented state. You know, we're on the, we're on the coast. Uh, we should be fortunate. That's our comparative advantage, as we say, in a lot of ways in South Carolina to have this this great port, and we want to take advantage of it, and we know it's what a major driver it's been in trade overall, international trade. We're an international school of business that's known around the world for promoting globalization. Most of my colleagues, I have to tell you, I'll be honest, and I, I'm not just speaking for myself, I think I'm speaking for the Moore School of Business when we believe that globalization can bring more positives than negatives. Um, but that's not what we're hearing these days a lot. There's been this reaction against globalization I'm going to address that in my talk today. So who would think in the 21st century we'd, we'd be in this, this retreat from globalization uh, and that we're going to have tariffs that we already have seen are, are dampening our economic growth and affecting our state's economy. So this puts a, a, a significant storm cloud over our economic outlook. Um, but I want to show you that there, tell you that there's some good news also today. But don't worry. There is a storm cloud, but we're not anticipating any hurricane, or any, any big calamity to hit at least the state's economy. I don't know about what the weather forecasters are going to say for next fall, but we should start using these color-coded maps for our forecast, too. I think uh, they really raise the fear factor there, you know, when we see these things coming in. You know, everyone sees them for days. Remember this week, we waited and waited, waited for this storm to come in. And then finally, oh, it wasn't so bad. But the economy, as I say, is, is in good shape. Um, and the U.S. economy is going to set a record this year. Uh, it's going to be the longest expansion in, in U.S. history, and the reason we know that that's going to happen in July and continue throughout the next year is, as Joey was talking about before, the fundamentals are really strong. We've got consumer spending up. I'm going to come back to that again. I want to strengthen some of the points that, that Dr. Van Nessen was talking about. Business investment is, is healthy, could be better. Um, I'll talk about that as well. Uh, Joy didn't mention government spending, but government spending is actually increasing right now, so that's actually boosting the economy as well. But then we've got these causes for concern, so this is what I'm going to be talking about. The causes for concern in particular are, are the, 
looming trade war, the ongoing uh, tweets about the trade war, the changing policies as a result of that that affect our businesses and their decisions as to where to locate. Uh, and we're a state that has more, but we calculated this. This is, this is something, if the press is here, you can quote me on. I finally was able to determine South Carolina on a relative basis has more international investment than any other state in the country. So we're very internationally oriented. That's often it's something that's, that's stated, uh, but I can, I can give you the figures if you really want to see that. We are a state that is highly globalized, uh, especially in the manufacturing sector, as you know. The other concern that we have is about rising interest rates this year, so I'll return to that issue as well. But I really want to spend most of my time emphasizing the, the trade war. So 10 years ago, remember that? Unbelievable, we had this great recession. Well, we actually were pessimistic that year. Some people think we're optimistic every year. We're not. Uh, in 2008, if you were here, you would re remember that we were not optimistic about the state of the economy for good reasons. Uh, there, were, there was a lot going on that was a cause for concern. In particular, we had a lot of financial fr fragility. You know, we had the whole crisis on Wall Street with the derivatives and the mortgage-backed securities and then the housing market collapse and the crisis, uh, stock market, you know, plummeted. It was, it was a real time of fear and panic. We're not there right now by any means. That's not gonna happen in 2019 as it happened 10 years ago. We also don't have the price shocks that we had then. Some people might not remember this, but it, just at the time we had all this financial turmoil going on, we also had rising gas prices. And nothing concerns, especially consumers, but businesses as well, is to drive down the street and see, you know, this is the one price everybody knows. They see it every day. You're driving down the street, you see these gas prices just raise, rising all the time. And that causes a lo real lack of, of confidence in the economy. Uh, so we, we had that, that big price shock hitting us at the same time 10 years ago um, as we had the crisis on Wall Street. Well, we don't have that problem right now. If anything, we're gonna see lower gas prices this year. Um, as, we can, as, we, as far as we can tell, a lot of supply is gonna be put on the market into 2019. That's gonna keep gas prices uh, incredibly low, which is a benefit for everybody because that's money they can spend on other goods and services. We also have a fiscal stimulus coming in. I'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, and we're getting a tighter monetary policy, but it's still incredibly easy compared to anything we saw uh, going into the recession last year. So this is, this is why uh, we, we feel good about where we are going into the next year. Um, now, our president, and here's one of his tweets. You know, as you know, he has an ambitious goal of reaching 4% growth in GDP. Joey showed you where we are in GDP right now. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to reach that goal. I mean, we might reach it in one quarter, and, and um, President Trump was very happy that we did that last year. But it's not normal. It's, it's really going to be, it would be um, unprecedented to see something like that, 4% growth. Not that we wouldn't like it. I, I'm just not sure where we'd find the labor to support that kind of growth. Uh, but it's not going to happen. I mean, we've, we've got some significant headwinds against this growth that's going to keep growth probably in the range of, of two to three percent, as Dr. Von Nessen was talking about. So what, what drives that growth? Let me first start about and uh, talk about the overall economy, more from a U.S. perspective, not South Carolina. We'll come back to that in a minute. But when we talk about growth, as you all know, we measure it by gross domestic product or GDP. That's our best measure of, of um, goods and services produced in the economy during the year. And Dr. Van Nechen was talking about these are the drivers. These are the main components of GDP. There's consumption. That's by far the biggest one. Two-thirds of our economy depends on consumer spending. So I'll come back to that in a minute, but that's what really matters. Consumers cut back like they did in 2008 to 2010. The whole economy goes down with it. People get laid off, and there's less income, and there's less consumer spending, and we get into a downward spiral but we still see consumption going up right now, and that is two-thirds, again, of, of the economy. So that's, that's what we pay attention most in our forecast. Then there's business investment. Very important, not as big a component of our overall economy, but it drives our future growth, and I'll return to that point in my remarks later. Finally, there's government spend, well, there's also government spending, um, and that's, that's also growing, not as big as consumption, a little bigger, it's growing faster than investment. But then there's this, this drag 
we call it net exports, but it's really the balance of exports and imports. Since imports are rising, and they still are rising faster despite these tariffs, then, then exports are rising, so this is pulling down our growth. So that's, that's where we are right now. Good consumption, investment rising, so is government spending, but our trade sector is what's pulling us down, but it's not that big uh, overall part of the U.S. economy as it would be in many other countries of the world. So we have a large domestic market, so we really depend on the consumer. So let's talk about consumer spending. I want to really emphasize that Sentiment is still high in this country. Consumer sentiment uh, measured by the University of Michigan's index and other measures of consumers' feelings about the economy overall are very, very favorable right now. Consumers are feeling good, partly because they're driving down the street and they're seeing those, those gas prices come down, but they're also seeing more, you know, their wages start to tick up, and Dr. Van Essen will come back and talk to that in a minute, and that's what's gonna fuel our consumer spending going into 2019. Because that spending is dependent on what we call in economics disposable income. That's the income that people receive less taxes. So not only are people seeing personal income grow, but because of the Tax Act last year, 80% of the population uh, or residents of our country have been uh, affected by that. Lower taxes mean even greater disposable income. So disposable income is still very positive. The other thing that, that drives consumer spending, uh, not as important, but it is still uh, critical, and we saw that 10 years ago, is wealth. You know, income and wealth are not the same thing. Income is what you make annually every year, and wealth is your stock portfolio and your housing value primarily. And both of those are looking very positive. That wasn't true in 2008, but it's definitely true right now that the market, you know, is, is, is you know, flattened a bit, uh, but it's still done incredibly well, as we all know, and if, if you've got, you know, your 401k or you've got other investments, uh, you're probably feeling pretty good, and that's going to help generate more consumer spending, as, as well as the housing uh, appreciation, or at least we haven't seen depreciation as we were seeing 10 years ago. So consumers are, are going to be feeling good as a result of, of wealth, as well as disposable income. Uh, and then finally, there's this low interest rate environment that we've been in since the Great Recession. Uh, and we're starting to see an increase in interest rates, uh, but they're still at historic lows. And these low interest rates uh, support this continual debt finance consumption. We're a debt-oriented economy. We depend on credit and debt, uh, as we all know, in many different forms. Uh, and low interest rates has just been generating more and more and rising amounts of debt in the economy. And we've got to be concerned about that. In fact, we're actually at a record in terms of overall household debt right now of $14 trillion. So if you're reading the business press, oh, we should worry about this right now. We're at a record amount of debt. We should be concerned about that. But actually, relative to our disposable income, which is growing too, it's still very favorable and, and really considerably below the peak of where we were before the Great Recession, where we had much higher levels of household debt relative to income. So that's what helped throw us into that recession. Um, so most debt is in housing, uh, most is mortgage debt, $10 trillion of the $14 trillion of debt overall in the U.S. economy. And mortgage debt uh, is actually below where we were in 2008, actually in, in absolute terms. So consumers are not heavily indebted right now, and when they're having to pay off debts, that means they're not going to be able to consume and not help grow our economy. Now, we are seeing rising non-mortgage debt. Uh, that's at an all-time high, but it's only $4 trillion. These are big numbers. $4 trillion out of that $14 trillion overall. Uh, those are student loans. You hear a lot about that. Auto loans, credit card loans, and that is growing. It is somewhat of a concern. Um, it's rising from 20 26% of, uh, of disposable income for 22% of disposable income. But that isn't going to throw us into a crisis. Um, if you really want a good book on how economic debt cycles work, um, I suggest reading Ray Dalio. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. He's the one who um, runs, I think he still runs it, uh, Bridgewater Capital, the largest private equity firm in uh, the U.S., uh, and also very astute economist because he really pays attention to debt cycles. And this book, by the way, is available for free, so you can get online and go see it. And he talks about debt cycles and where we are right now. 
And when we get high levels of debt, uh, at some point that reaches a breaking point and that bubble bursts and that we go into a recession. That's not going to happen this year. I'm not sure what Ray Dalio says. Well, actually, I am. I heard him say that he's not, he's not anticipating that either. Maybe in a couple of years, if, if the debt, that, that household, this trillion dollar, $14 trillion of debt rises, we will get to that crisis point. Um, but we're not seeing it right now. So uh, if you want to be more convinced of that argument, go go on YouTube and listen to his his, uh, his uh, video lectures, or you can you can get the book. I really encourage you to do that. Um, uh, it's very much in line with the way I think about debt cycles and how they affect the economy. So we're in good we're in good shape, and this shows you that as well. This is. U.S. consumer debt service, this is what people are actually paying, what they're servicing. This is money out of their pockets that they're not spending on goods and services. And you can see how this works right now is, is that is a ratio of disposable income that's declining. Um, you can see across here that uh, the different recessions, look at where we were 10 years ago with rising amount of computer, uh, uh, debt service having to be paid off, but then people just started paying down their debts and we're in much better shape. This is, this is the source of our confidence. Uh, at least on the consumer side, consumer debt service being down an overall amount of household debt, not at anywhere near a critical point. Now, interest rates. Now, they're going to affect us. This is, this is something we are very worried about uh, if it's done wrong. And we know who controls us. That's the Federal Reserve. Interest rates over 10 years. You can see what's been happening. Uh, we had this period where there was a lot of accommodative monetary policy, is the way we put it in economics, uh, which means easy money. Uh, fueled by the Federal Reserve, and uh, that helped generate this expansion that we've been in now for 10 years. But then they started unwinding. That started unwinding the so-called quantitative easing program that was put in place under Ben Bernanke and then Janet Yellen. Uh, and now uh, we're starting to see interest rates increase. Uh, this is the 10-year bond. We're also seeing this, this inverted yield curve you might be familiar with where uh, Short-term interest rates are rising faster than long-term interest rates, so there's this flattening of the yield curve. That's all often a predictor of a recession. I don't think that's, that's a good predictor in this case, because we're in a whole different monetary ballgame these days uh, with what the Federal Reserve is doing. So I don't, I don't think the past is, is a good indication of what the future is going to be, be like. But we do have to be a bit concerned about these rising interest rates if they, if they, if they increase too fast. And our Central bank has done that in the past. They've raised rates too fast, and they will throw us into a recession. But we don't want that, nor does our president, and that's why he's tweeting about this all the time. And here he is talking about, um, you know, we should not, what does he say, we should not have uh, penalized, we should not be penalized for doing so well. Tightening now hurts all that we have done. Um, you know, there's actually some truth to that. Uh, I, I think we do need to see starting to get back to normal interest rates. We don't want them to rise too fast. But on the, uh, on the other hand, he's basically, I, I think he's taking the extreme position, as he often does, to make the, sure the Federal Reserve stays moderate. I think that's his sort of his plan here. Uh, and there's some indication that Jerry Powell, the chair of the Federal Reserve, is picking up on that because he was talking about just a, a month ago a whole set of interest rate increases going into 2019, um, which we put into our forecast, but then he moderated that after some of these tweets came out, and it looks like it's going to be a little slower going. Now, we don't control this. Uh, we'll see what happens, but it's really this inter interesting interplay uh, between the president, who is very vocal about this, uh, and the Federal Reserve, which is supposed to be independent of our government in terms of making this decisions, but, you know, but who, who's ever totally independent? Uh, everything, I guess, is ultimately political. So we'll see, but our, our, we're anticipating we're going to see a very careful stepwise increase in interest rates, and that's what we want. If, if you raise interest rates very quickly, it throws everything off. Not only does it throw consumer spending off, but it throws off the dollar. The dollar will strengthen, um, and uh, that's going to hurt our exports, and it has a whole set of other problems, actually, in the rest of the world, too, and can throw the whole world into a global crisis. And this has happened before. Uh, but I think the Federal Reserve knows that, so they're going to be moderate in terms of their... Okay, so I've talked about consumption. We think consumers are in the right mood and have the wallet to be able to spend into 2019. So the next big component of GDP is business investment, something we've been talking about right now in terms of opportunity zones. Even though it's not as large a component of our GDP, it's 
critical in terms of driving our future productivity and our economic opportunity as we've been talking about today. This is where our growth ultimately depends. We've got to be investing. We're not a country that invests a lot as a share of our GDP. Other countries do much more. China is a good example of that. They invest a lot more, and you see that in terms of their growth rates. They give growth rates of six, seven percent. They're, 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 they're using that to drive a higher productivity economy. Um, Here's our business investment growth right now, year over year. See what happens in a recession going back to 2009. We had this huge drop off in investment. This is the rate of change of investment. And that's what happens in recession. So that just makes a bad problem even worse. Then investment started to pick up again. But oddly, for the last 10 years, even though we've had a good economy, we haven't had real strong business investment, capital investment. I'm talking about investment in plant and equipment. Okay, I'm not talking about financial investment. I'm talking about investment that makes our economy more productive. Uh, then we had the corporate profits tax cut, and we did start to see uh, an increase in investment, but it's starting to level off right now. So going into next year, we're thinking we're not going to see a lot of investment necessarily growth. We're not going to see a decline necessarily, but we're not seeing a lot of growth. And here's what drives investment. Um, first of all, it's anticipated growth. When companies see growth, uh, when they see a market opportunity, they're going to make that capital investment. That's what's most fundamental. But there's risk taking, or what we say in economics, there's animal spirits. Um, and that's what we're not seeing a lot of these days. If you go back to the 1990s, there's lots of entrepreneurial activity, lots of risk taking. Lately, there has not been. Most of the investment is coming from a very small number of companies that we all know that are doing very well on the stock market. We've got an economy that's much more concentrated in these investment decisions, uh, concentrated in these very few countries. We do, uh, companies. We don't have as much entrepreneurial activity and as, as much overall risk-taking as we used to have. Um, that's a phenomenon we have to be a bit concerned about. But what we do have, especially in these these companies that are, are doing so well, particularly the tech companies, it's huge profits. We've got a lot of profits, but they're using those profits, as we know, for corporate uh, or for, for stock buybacks, and they're not investing it in real capital it, to the extent that we would like to see that to make our economy more productive, uh, despite the lower corporate profits tax. Uh, we had some uptick, as I just showed you in investment, but not to the extent um, that you would expect, given how sound our economy really is and the opportunities that are out there. Uh, they're also given accelerated depreciation. That should encourage more investment. Uh, this has uh, also been uh, an era in which we're seeing a significantly reduced regulatory burden. So it's a good time for private sector investment. Maybe this is what we need then, incentives in these opportunity zones. There's all this money sitting out there, these unrealized capital gains, private sector capital. Trillions of dollars of private sector capital that may translate at least into hundreds of billions of dollars of investment that would go into our less advantaged dis or disadvantaged communities into these opportunity zones. So there's a big incentive there. Uh, we'll see how that plays out. That probably won't be next year, as we know. We're still trying to get the regulations on this and get this program set. But into the future, this could be um, something that will help see us find an increase finally in, in and this is what I'd like to see is real productive investment um, throughout the United States. Now let's look at what business expansions look like in terms of investment over the last few decades. In the 1990s, we did have a lot of investment and that was primarily in technology that you probably know about. There was the dot-com boom, but there was more than that. There was a lot of computer equipment in, uh, investment at that time too. Significant amount more, much more than now. This was just at the time of the beginning of the internet. A lot of companies, a lot of households were buying computers um, and uh, really increasing their amount of, of technology and investment at a rate we, we, we even in, in this age, we still, we still don't see. That came down, crashing down in 2001 with the dot-com bust and the stock market crash as a result of that. And we haven't seen any kind of technological investment to that extent. Another thing that happened back then, you might remember, was Y2K. Remember Y2K? Everybody's worried about Y2K, so they got new computers because they thought their old computer was, was going to crash on them uh, when the millennium came. So after what was, the companies were doing this, too. They were encouraged to do it. I think this was a, a conspiracy on the part of tech companies to get people to buy more, but it worked. Uh, maybe we need something like that again. Uh, nothing like fear to drive investment. But then there was uh, an investment wave that was quite different uh, once we recovered from that period in 2001 to 2007. 
And that was driven by primarily real estate construction, as you all know, and that led to that bubble that also then came down and, and collapsed. And we haven't seen investment in the housing and uh, commercial real estate sector to the extent that we had in that particular period. So there's a lot of investment at that time. Then from 2010 to 2015, the only real, really uh, uptick in investment that we saw was in, in oil and gas, you know, the fracking. That was pretty significant. A lot of capital investment in that area. Actually, it's still ongoing. That's why our oil prices are down. But beyond that, we're not seeing significant amounts of new capital investment. So what's the future? Where would that investment go? Well, I would argue, you know, we've got these technologies out there, uh, but they're just not being utilized to the extent that they should be in automation, AI, deep learning. You've heard about these investments, and some companies are doing that. We are seeing that. I've heard the CEO of Salesforce recently talking about it. They're getting lots of orders, Salesforce being one that is involved in enterprise solutions for uh, using cloud-based services. Uh, so they're getting a lot of orders out in, in the Silicon Valley uh, in, in this area of, of, of automation and AI. Uh, but I think that's where the future investment is. That's really where the opportunity is going to be once we get people willing to take the kind of risks um, uh, that we you know, used to see before in the U.S. economy and take a leadership role in automation. One way to do that, I don't think this is going to happen under this administration, we should, I would argue we should have probably be targeted that corporate profit tax cut um, towards productive investment. What we have is under Trump, we had uh, every firm getting this corporate profits tax cut down to 21 percent. That makes us very competitive with the rest of the world. Well, you know, Japan did the same thing under Prime Minister Abe, and what they did was cut their uh, corporate profits tax down to 20 percent, but they had stipulations that firms had to raise wages and train employees. They had to show they were doing that. They also had to increase high-quality domestic investments in automation. And you're going to see this happening in Japan. They're having the Olympics in 2020, and you're going to see how highly automated they are, are becoming. Uh, they're getting ahead of us. Those technologies are out there. They're the ones that are implementing it. And I'll tell you another country that's doing that, and that's China. I've been there. They have a significant program for investment in automation right now, uh, and they're serious about it. Uh, and uh, even though we have the patents, they're the ones that are going to implement this technology, uh, and it's going to make them much more productive. So we need to get a program that channels more of this money out of stock buybacks and what I would call generally unproductive investment into productive investment. And that's just not the way we think in America. We just sort of put these blanket policies out there and hope that that will happen. I think they should be more targeted. And maybe that's true of the enterprise zones as too. I hope that this doesn't go into unproductive types of investments, but it has helps these communities um, raise uh, their overall level of, of productivity. All right, so that we talked about consumption. I've talked about private investment now. Uh, consumption being highly favorable, we think going into 2019, investment could be better given the state of the economy. Then there's public spending, then there's the government. Uh, Joey didn't get to talk about this much, but actually government spending is increasing. And you know where? It's in the military. A lot of military spending. A bipartisan agreement last year to spend more in the military. That helps our state. We get a lot of spending from the military, from the federal government, not just with our military bases, with the big uh, spay war program that they have in Charleston. Uh, so that, that's going to continue into 2019 as well. So in addition to the private sector, we've got public spe sector spending uh, coming into, a, uh, into play as well. But of course, that's going to drive up our deficit. See, our deficit was going down, uh, in, in it, especially after the recession. Then we started to see some significant improvement over the last 10 years in the federal deficit. But now it looks like these tax cuts are not paying for themselves, and we got more federal spending, so the combination of the two means the deficit's going to increase. But then, hey, who worries about that anymore? Apparently, not, nobody. <laughs> um, but uh, the, 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 you know, the reality is we can probably handle this. It's not going to cause any crisis, at least next year. Long term is something we should worry about. But 2019, you're going to see more federal spending, again, primarily from military spending. Then the other big deficit that we should be talking about, and this is what I really want to spend the rest of my remarks really emphasizing, is the federal trade deficit. And you can see how, uh, how that works. Uh, we saw this is the deficit going down. You can see 
um, is, is negative is, is, is bad, but then we saw some improvement during the Great Recession. That's because consumers aren't spending so much on imports. That seemed to be the only way we get our trade deficit to improve. Then it kind of leveled off after, uh, after the Great Recession, our trade deficit, and that's where we've been. But this has been the major concern of our president. He thinks this is our major problem, uh, that we've got to turn this around and get this into the black and out of the red. So he's tweeting about this even today, every day. Um, and the two countries that seem to be mostly in his sights are, or at least initially were, Mexico and China. Here's a couple of tweets uh, from our president about the trade war. He's, you know, he's tweeting about China, saying uh, we are, well, it actually says we're not in a trade war in this tweet. Uh, that was lost many years ago. Um, the people, you know, uh, by incompetent people who represented the U.S. now have a trade deficit of $500 billion. Actually, that's pretty much right if you talk about the current account. Uh, so he's very concerned about that, and this is what he wants to turn around. Um, also, as we know, very uh, worried about the implications of NAFTA uh, and the worst trade deal ever uh, in history. And you know, uh, he took that on like no president I expected ever would. Well, how is this going to affect South Carolina? Um, we're talking about tariffs. That's the that's weapon he's using in this war. We're a state that actually has a history of opposing tariffs. Um, does anyone know who this gentleman is over here? For those of you who have gone to the USC library, you might know this man, Thomas Cooper. He was president of what was then called South Carolina College, now the University of South Carolina back in the 1820s and into the 1830s. He was also an economist and wrote a lot. He didn't tweet, but he wrote a lot uh, about tariffs, and he was opposed to them. Uh, he, um, well, one of his, his he described uh, the South as a perennial loser in an unequal alliance with the North, and almost sounds like a tweet from our president these days, but that's Thomas Cooper. Speaking, this is our history in, in our economics department of opposing tariffs and being pro-free trade. What he was arguing against was something called the tariff of abominations back in the 1820s, which were tariff rates of up to 60% and above to keep out European, primarily Great Britain's manufactured goods coming into the U.S. You probably know the story, uh, to protect the North so that they could grow an industrial base, but the South opposed those. So Thomas Cooper was a leader, along with John C. Calhoun from South Carolina, in opposing tariffs. So that's our history. We don't, we don't like these, or at least we didn't used to. Uh, but that's not the current state of Washington. So I don't know what Thomas Cooper would say these days uh, about Trump's tweets, but here's what he's saying. Tariffs are the greatest. He had another tweet on this today. Um, but this is an older one. Tariffs are the greatest. Either a country which has treated the United States unfairly on trade negotiates a fair deal or it gets hit with tariffs. And boy, he's hit them and hit them hard. Uh, again, very surprising to the extent to which he's been so aggressive and bellicose in this area. First one being this big tariff fight with China. I want to talk about that. Uh, as you can see here, this is how it unfolded just last year. And this is an ongoing story, this tariff war. So we started last year in 2018 with uh, a 10 percent tariff on $200 billion of Chinese goods and services. And it's typical in a trade war, what happens is they retaliate. So China came back and they put duties on $110 billion of U.S. goods. But, this is important for our state, a 40 percent duty on U.S. autos. So who does that affect? Our state. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But then the story isn't over. Uh, now, the latest, and this is just in the last week, 2019, they're saying now that these are just threats, um, you know, and um, the U.S. has uh, duties may, uh, you know, increase to 25 percent. Uh, but now, in 2019, there's a ceasefire that was announced in, in just last, at the, at the summit um, in Argentina between President Xi of China and, and President Trump. We, we don't know if this is a real ceasefire. You know, you listen to one side, they say one thing, the other side says the other. But it looks like they're going to spend 90 days at least trying to find some way of uh, keeping this war from escalating. And China has already committed, at least verbally, to uh, cutting their import duties on U.S. cars. And that's very important for the U.S. Um, now, 
and for, and, and for South Carolina. Um, now these tariff problems, let's talk about in terms of South Carolina business. They're gonna ha they already have had, we've seen an impact. Uh, they raised both import and domestic supply prices that are hurting our manufacturers. Of course they hit all consumers, but they don't really notice this. They don't have a lobby and they just go to the store. They don't know how that tariff figures into the price of goods. Uh, but the producers do, do and th that has affected, uh, to some extent, all of our manufacturers uh, are in, in this state and around the country. Uh, and China's retaliation, so you'd have to argue, in a lot of ways, has already uh, uh, affected us. Um, and the reason is, here's, here's our uh, North American auto assembly plants. As you can see in the red, those are the foreign-owned assembly plants, the Japanese, the Koreans, uh, and the Germans, as we know, uh, in this state. Uh, the, the blue are the, the domestic big three automakers. I'll also show you what's going on in Mexico, because we do com compete in the auto sector with Mexico. It also shows Canada. So this is, this is where the assemblers are, a lot of suppliers or, or, um, located around these assemblers. We're different in that we're the one that's export oriented uh, in South Carolina. This is why these tariffs, especially with China, the 40% tariff on automobiles hits our state harder than anyone else. BMW exports 70% of the X series that it produces to the rest of the world. It's not serving the domestic market. All these other plants are almost entirely domestic market oriented. Volvo came in doing the same thing. Volvo said, we're gonna follow BMW, well, I didn't say this explicitly, but it looks like this is what they, they, their strategy is. Follow BMW's lead and use South Carolina as an export platform for certain vehicles. BMW uses it for its SUV, and that's the same strategy that Volvo was gonna use, but these tariffs throw that into a tailspin. Uh, and so it really affects our state in a very significant way uh, when we see tariffs, especially 40% tariffs as China put on. And we saw what happened with exports. A lot of that was BMWs. We believe, it's, it's hard to prove that exactly, but we see that with declining exports. So we, we, we saw a lot of volatil volatility in, in, in the trade sector last year because of our export orientation in this very significant sector of our state's economy. With BMW, Volvo coming in, I'll also show you Mercedes up here uh, making the Sprinter vans, although they're mostly domestic mar uh, oriented, US market oriented. But Volvo and BMW being unique in that they're export oriented. We want an export oriented economy. That brings in money from outside of our country. Uh, rather than just compete BMW with other domestic producers for the domestic market, they're, they're, they're competing across the world and bringing that income back into South Carolina that otherwise wouldn't be there and then spread across the country. So that's why exports are really important. We're tapping into that, that market that's outside of us rather than cannibalizing existing markets. We want export-oriented producers. At least that's what I teach our students. Well, here's BMW and what they do. We, you know, when we look at BMW, they've got a lot of plants around here. They don't have to be in South Carolina. In fact, they're not just in South Carolina. They're spread around the world. Uh, they've got the plant in Mexico that I mentioned before. Actually, that's slated to open next year. Uh, and they can shift their models around as well. Right now, we're producing the X series. They're already shifting some of the SUVs, the X model, into South Africa to serve China. We don't want that. That's that we should be. We're already doing that. We could be bringing that income back into the United States. And you can see, if you look uh, uh, on the right side there, you'll see the the plant that they do have in China, Shen. Shenyang, China, I've been to this plant, they're very aggressive about getting more BMW investment to serve their domestic market. And they're starting to get some of the X-Series as well. Uh, they're, they're starting to invest there. BMW made a, a big announcement of, after the tariffs uh, you know, to increase, increase the amount of investment to serve the, the Chinese market. Uh, China's very, very smart about how they, uh, um, you know, they negotiate with, with companies like BMW. They, they require that they come in and get a joint venture partner. And you see that's the, the blue. Uh, BMW has a joint venture that's called Brilliance China. And of course, there's some degree of technology transfer that goes on there and everything. This is what they require. They say, you want our market. We got a big mass market, just like we do in the United States. But you want our market in China. Here's the rules you're going to have to play by. And one of them is you're going to have to have a joint venture partner. Another one is you're going to have to put a significant amount of local content here, including engine production. Uh, so they've got engines being produced there. We don't. They negotiated over this um, in Shenyang. 
so um, they're very smart, and they're going to get more investment. So we have, to, we have to think about that in the context of what we do in terms of our own policies. But BMW, I have to tell you, is still investing in South Carolina. Uh, they're not giving up. This is what they're saying, at least publicly. They claim publicly there's been no loss of sales to the X Series despite this trade war so far. It doesn't seem right, but um, Dr. Van Nessen was talking about this before. It looks like they cut back a little bit, and they mostly didn't cut permanent, the, the, the full time associates that they have, but some of the contingent labor, uh, using that flexibility that they could. Now I think they're, you know, if, if China does keep these duties down, they cut them from 40% down to 15%, maybe we can get U.S., that is the Spartanburg plant production, back into China. You know, they can ramp that back up. Um, so the tariffs are potentially coming down, and that's going to be good for South Carolina. They're still investing here uh, in Spartanburg, at least $600 million ongoing in investment right now, adding to the $5 billion in, of investment that they have in our state. Um, and they are claiming that they will produce a record number of automobiles in 2019. So I guess that's encouraging because they're uh, one of our major producers, and I think that's going to be a good signal to Volvo and the others to maintain their commitments to our state. Now, so that's China and what's going on now in terms of the trade war. It's an ongoing battle, uh, but it looks like there's some positive news there now for our state. So let's turn to what's going on with the other big battle. There's many, but this is the other big one, the U.S.-Mexico trade war. I like to say it ended this year. It didn't start that way, but I like to think it did, did end with NAFTA now becoming the USMCA, the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement. I like to so like saying NAFTA, but we're not allowed to say that anymore. Uh, but that's what, you know, that's what was renegotiated. A lot of people don't know this, but there's some good things in there for our state, uh, and in particular for the automobile sector again. It requires 75% North American content to qualify for tariff-free trade, which is what the free trade agreement is supposed to allow. That's, that's a significant amount of local content. Uh, that means more Suppliers locating around the major assemblers. Uh, it means more, a larger multiplier effect. Dr. Van mentioned was talking about, Vanessa was talking before about our multiplier effect. The auto industry has the highest economic multiplier effect of any se uh, sector. It can even go higher uh, than the, the range that is in about one to three right now, uh, it, especially if we can get engine production. Uh, the other interesting thing, and I found this most fascinating in terms of the negotiation over NAFTA, now becoming this USMCA, uh, is the 40 to 45 percent automobile content that must be made by workers earning at least $16 an hour. This is a Republican administration that is mandating like a minimum wage in the auto sector. You got to love that. I mean, they like minimum wages now in the auto sector. Um, and uh, this has not been approved yet by Congress, but I would think the Democrats are going to like it. I don't see how they could oppose something like that. This is pro-union. It's also pro-union in the sense that Mexico uh, will have to pay, use unionized labor now. One thing they do now is they pay, they're, they're supposed to use union labor down in Mexico, but they undercut it sometimes, and, and it goes down, let's take tire production. Um, we have big tire sector in our state, as you all know. We pay in the range of nine to fifteen dollars an hour for production workers. You know what they pay in Mexico without union labor? One dollar an hour. That's what we're competing with. So when you see this kind of rule being put in place, where Mexico is going to have to be paying up to sixteen dollars an hour, this is going to set a precedent, and this is favorable for us because this will level the playing field. I think this is what we want to do. If it took a threat of tariffs to do that, I think this is a good thing. It'll mean we're, we're in a better competitive position in South Carolina in the overall automobile sector to get more investments and keep the jobs here. So, let's see, I'm kind of in favor of this. We'll see if they pass it. Congress is going to come back in January and they're going to debate this. It's going to be interesting to see how Republicans line up versus how Democrats, given how pro-labor this agreement really is. So here's Trump's latest threatening tweet. Uh, import restrictions on all Ford automobiles. Just as we think things are settling down, nope, not so much. After GM announced that, this was, uh, you know, last week after GM announced the closing of multiple U.S. plants, uh, he's now talking about tariffs on Japanese, South Korean, German automobile makers. Um, again, they're going into a tailspin. 
this echoes what we call the chicken tariffs. Uh, uh, President Trump talks about these a lot. We have tariffs, actually, that we put in place years ago, in the 1970s, actually, on light trucks. That's one place where we do have significant tariffs, 25%. That's why we still produce a lot of trucks in the U.S. That's one thing we've maintained. That's another reason why we see printer vans being produced here and SUVs, because they're on a truck chassis. If that, that makes it favorable to produce in the U.S. because of these tariffs. They do work. The reason it's called the chicken tax is because it was the Europeans that started putting duties on our chicken uh, exports. So we retaliated with these tariffs on the light trucks, and they still call it the chicken tax. I guess um, Trump read about this or heard about this from his advisors and said, we need to get back to that. Let's put on a significant tariff again on these European automakers, and then they're going to have to ship production back into the U.S. They're not only putting these tariffs on the final good of the automobiles, but they're also putting the tariffs on the, on the auto components, on the auto parts. That could actually, if even the threat of this, be a good thing. Um, because we don't have, as I said before, engine production or drivetrain production in the U.S., like China does. We don't have that. But this could make the decision of these companies to start to invest more in the U.S. to get beyond these tariffs. Um, what I'm showing you here is the impact that BMW has. We, we've, we really did an impact of BMW, and I'm just showing you some bottom line results here. BMW hires, at least it did, at the height of their production a couple years ago, 10,000 workers, roughly. They produce a value added of about 3.9, almost $4 billion in our state, and an overall economic value of the output of $16 billion. Um, this is without the multiplier effects, without the suppliers and everything else. Actually, the job number would be over 30,000 if uh, we included everything that is associated with BMW's activities. But this is just the direct activities up in the Spartanburg plant. Um, but if you look at the value added, that is like the GDP. That's what we capture here in the U.S. That's $4 billion out of $16 billion. In other words, the value of the cars is $16 billion. We're capturing in this state $4 billion. There's a lot of room to grow there. And if we could get those engines and those drivetrains, we would see a much more, even much more significant impact. So who knows? Maybe that's what will work. Um, but BMW has already announced that they're looking for a plant for engine production in the United States as a result of just last week's trade war skirmish. Um, and if it, it, you know, there's like everything in economics, you know, there's, you know, there's one hand and the other hand. On the one hand, this trade war could be really bad. It's bad for consumers and producers, especially as, you know, they have to pay higher prices for, for these imported, imported components. But if we get production to move into the U.S., um, that would be a positive for us. You go back to the Reagan administration, they did that. They threatened uh, Japan um, and then eventually got them to have voluntary export restraints in the early 1980s to restrain their exports. They agreed to do that, sort of like quotas. But then after that, after they made that agreement, that's when we started to see the wave of investment start to come in from Japan in the early 1980s. Um, and they're still here. Uh, so something like that could happen. All right, so that's what's going on with the trade war. It's an ongoing dispute. Um, hopefully, there, I, I want to believe um, that there'll be a trade truce with China, and this will, will uh, be set next year. Uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with that because the trade negotiators uh, that Trump has put in place are very, very bellicose and belligerent against China. They don't, some of them, I don't think they just want a trade war. They want an outright war if you listen to the way they talk. Uh, well, let's hope that's not the case. Um, but I, you know, we, we did see some indication recently that we're, we're at least going to enter a 90-day period in which we're going to have a truce, and we're, we're going to we're going to see how how China responds, and if the, the administration in Washington agrees to that, maybe we'll finally get some resolution on that and and st some stability so that companies can make some permanent decisions for investment. Finally, uh, well, in addition, next year Congress, uh, we'll see, will they pass this U.S. MCA? I have a feeling the politics are going to line up in favor of this, so we're probably going to see this. We're not, the alternative that Trump is talking about is just getting rid of NAFTA, uh, and then we're, we're back to where we were years ago. Uh, I just don't see that, something that's realistic in the 21st century. All right, so that's, that's, that's what's going to happen with trade next year. In terms of Consumer spending, I mentioned before, um, it's going to continue to be strong. We've got relative financial stability in the consumer sector, as I said. Household debt levels are not that high, so not at the end of this debt cycle yet. 
Uh, we're going to probably see moderate interest rate increases, so nothing too much to worry about there, hopefully. Uh, and we've got the potential for investment. Uh, we probably won't see a huge surge in investment next year, uh, but that won't be negative either. Uh, uh, we're going to see stepped up government spending in the military, as I mentioned before. And finally, and hopefully, finally, after 10 years, maybe we'll see a significant increase in wages. We ought to be seeing that with the tight labor market that we have. And that's what Dr. Van Nessen is going to be talking about next. So thank you very much. And I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Van Nessen to thank you.